Hello, I'm Aaron Lohr, and this is the Endocrine News Podcast. We're continuing our series, Endocrine in the Time of COVID, and today we're going to be talking about the health disparities we're seeing in this pandemic. Joining us is Dr. Joshua Joseph, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Thanks for being with us today, Dr. Joseph. Thank you so much for inviting me. So if you're reading the news today about COVID, and I'm sure many of us are, I don't know how you can get away from it, then you know COVID-19 is impacting some racial ethnic groups far more than others. So what are the current data showing us? What the current data are showing is that when we think about COVID-19 and we think about cases, so those who have contracted COVID-19, hospitalizations requiring going to the hospital and being treated, and deaths, on all three of those critical pieces, we've seen higher rates in racial ethnic minority communities, including our Black populations throughout the United States, our Latinx populations throughout the United States, and now recently in California, some of the underrepresented Asian populations there as well. When we look at the disparities that we've seen, they, on the cases side, have been about twofold higher in many areas for uh, Blacks uh, and Latinx populations. For the hospitalizations, they have also been two to threefold higher in many areas. And then the same with deaths, where a national study of mortality rates per 100,000 residents uh, showed that for Black Americans, over 25 out of 100,000 residents had death from uh, COVID-19 of those who were infected, compared to less than 10 for the majority of other populations in the United States. These statistics are significant, and it makes you have to ask why. You know, so what are the factors that are driving these? rather profound disparities. One of the pieces that I'd like to point out is that these disparities existed in many ways pre-COVID. COVID is helping to point them out and shed light on them so that you know, everyone can kind of see them. But we know when we look at life expectancy, for instance, as just one measure, that uh, non-Hispanic black men and women have much lower life expectancies compared to non-Hispanic white uh, men and women. This lower life expectancy is thought to be due to a number of factors. And these factors are likely the same factors that are driving the profound disparities during COVID-19. So what do we see? We see a higher degree and higher rate of cardiometabolic conditions, including diabetes, obesity, and hypertension in some racial ethnic minority groups We also see these disparities at younger ages so that some racial ethnic minority groups are impacted earlier on in life, which then limits overall life expectancy. We also know that the social determinants of health are critical as well. And these include things such as economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, food security, community and social context, as well as the healthcare system these social determinants of health are really critical factors in determining someone's overall health. I've worked with uh, many individuals on the social determinants of health and trying to understand how they impact health. And one of the recent presentations uh, that we gave, uh, Dr. Daryl Gray, the Director of Healthy Community Initiative uh, at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, discuss these upstream determinants, midstream determinants, and downstream health outcomes. The downstream health outcomes, in normal times, we think about diabetes and heart disease and obesity, all of these conditions that we treat as endocrinologists. But in the COVID-19 pandemic, we're thinking about COVID-19 deaths as really a major downstream health outcome. Some of the midstream determinants of that are things like food insecurity, unsafe and overcrowded housing, income inequality, unemployment, education. These midstream determinants, you may be asking, how do they really impact those downstream health outcomes? 
Well, for instance, when we think about food insecurity, we know that food is really a foundation of health. You can't have a healthy immune system if you can't eat appropriate healthy foods on a consistent basis. So having food insecurity really increases your risk, not only of those downstream health outcomes, but also of death during COVID-19. And then upstream from those midstream determinants are those really structural upstream determinants, including poverty and discrimination, which we know are pivotal in leading to some of the midstream determinants that we see. So we kind of think of it as a framework of upstream determinants, midstream determinants, and downstream health outcomes. And we know that we really need to conquer all of those in order to have an impact during normal times and during COVID-19. So I want to come back to something you said a little bit earlier that COVID might merely be exposing something that's been around for long, long before. And then you've been telling us about all these other stats with the midstream and the high stream uh, social determinants. The issue is much, much larger. You know, COVID is only revealing something that is sort of this big, big issue that's been around for a long time. So how can we make serious headway in eliminating these health disparities? And what can we do? So what can doctors do? You know, what can researchers do? What can patients do? And what can policymakers do? I really think that from that perspective, it takes an all-hands-on-deck approach. When we think about physicians, first, I'd like to talk about the importance of continuing to address implicit bias and building trusted relationships through effective communication with patients. The Kerwin Institute of Race and Ethnicity at The Ohio State University defines implicit bias as the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. So these aren't conscious decisions, these are unconscious decisions. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control. The other name for this is unconscious bias. And Dr. Quinn Capers at The Ohio State University has been a world expert in this area and really shedding light on this area for me. So we know that looking a patient in the eye, having empathy, physical touch, which are all very difficult during COVID-19 as we move towards telehealth, are all important in building trusting patient-physician relationships which lead to improved adherence to recommendations and ultimately improved health. In 2018, there was a study in Oakland, California. It showed that for black men, shared cultural background of patient and provider led to higher rates of diabetes and cholesterol screening compared to when the cultural background was not shared. And this is particularly important now because the second piece of what they showed was that shared cultural background led to higher rates of agreeing to get a flu shot. We all know that coming up here in a few months, hopefully, we all will need to get vaccinations. And so the study, to me, really elucidated the importance of two things, trust and communication, because the shared cultural background was even more important for increasing screening rates in those black men with high levels of medical mistrust. And so this trust and communication piece is one piece that all endocrinologists and all providers can continue to work on. And I think that we're all going to have to think about that potentially a little bit differently as we continue to move towards telehealth, because that's going to be the next frontier. And how do you engage in those trusting behaviors through a virtual video visit? I think is a challenge that we'll all need to think about and strategize around best practices to do. Dr. Joseph, let me uh, ask you a little bit about unconscious bias. And so you're talking a a lot about the importance of trust and communication. I can't help but think that what could best sabotage trust and communication than this unconscious bias and such a underlying, sometimes subtle thing that you're, like you said, you're not even aware of, you know, are there, is there anything that people can do to get more in touch with the unconscious bias that they might have and and may not be completely aware of? There is something called the implicit association test that was uh, first done up at Harvard. 
And that can be taken anywhere, even in your home, just to kind of gauge where someone is as far as the implicit associations that someone would make. And then second, there is unconscious bias training. So Dr. Capers, as well as others, go around the country leading these sessions to really think about how we can improve our unconscious bias. An example of that is that we actually did that with our medical school admissions at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. And he actually published a study on this where we did a pre-post design. We did pre, where we did no uh, unconscious bias training, and we did post after sessions on unconscious bias. And what we showed was that we ended up recruiting not only a more diverse class with more women and more underrepresented minorities, but we also recruited a class that had higher MCAT scores. So it was not only more diverse, but there was actually even greater intellect in the classes that followed. And so there are training opportunities to both understand and implement changes that will lead to uh, decreases in implicit biases. And you mentioned earlier a study that showed if a healthcare provider and a patient shared cultural backgrounds that there was like this nice harmonizing. So that tells me that building diversity in the physician population is super important. You know, how important is that? And is there anything that groups are, are doing to help build up more of that diversity? Building and valuing diversity within healthcare organizations is just pivotal. We need to have a diversity of thought in all leadership meetings that we have, but probably even more importantly in leadership meetings around COVID-19 pandemic and how we're responding to that. In regards to that commitment at, you know, the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, I can proudly say that in 2020, Forbes ranked the medical center second best among the all healthcare systems in valuing diversity. Um, and I see that every day. I see that really from the ground up, from anyone who is involved in research, clinical teaching efforts, all the way through our top levels of leadership. We happen to have a African-American president at the Ohio State University. So it really does span from all levels uh, within our organization. In regards to our commitment to building the next generation of physicians and the pipeline of diverse leaders, I mentioned earlier, but we have a a really diverse medical school. So under the previous leadership, Vice Dean of Admissions, Dr. Quinn Capers, and under the current leadership of Dr. Demika Rankin, the OSU has over 50% women in our medical school classes and has the second most African-Americans of any medical school in the country outside of the historically black colleges. Um, So we value that once again in our training, the next generation of leaders. And I think that all healthcare organizations have the opportunity to build and not only build, but value diversity uh, within their organizations. Notably as a society, the endocrine society has been a leader among societies in this domain as well. With 25 years of work of the Minority Affairs Committee initially, now what we call CODI or the Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, we've had many efforts to both build and value a diversity in our organization. And the Endocrine News uh, this year has done the 25 years of diversity series. So all of our members can go see many of the efforts that have been performed over the last 25 years. And I'd like to just have a special note to our immediate past president, Dr. Uh, e. Dale Abel, and highlight the importance of all of his leadership in diversity in our organization and building the pipeline of diverse scientists through the Future Leadership Advancing Research in Endocrinology or the FLARE program that was developed under his leadership. Why don't we shift gears a little bit and talk about that researcher perspective? So what can researchers do? What's their role to play in this? So it is important to advance all aspects of science from cellular mechanisms and receptors all the way to population health and those upstream, midstream, and downstream factors that we discussed earlier. We all know that for far too many, their zip code is just as important as their genetic code. And we have to continue to have collaborative research to target person's physiology uh, in the context of their environment. So, you know, using that framework, targeting someone's physiology in the context of their environment, multi-level interventions are really paramount. And one of the ways that I think about this sometimes is to contrast the social ecological model, which one half of my brain uses as a public health researcher, uh, with the T0 to T4 translational research model, 
which the other half of my brain uses as a translational researcher. And so in that uh, social ecological model, it really helps to understand factors that affect behavior and also provides guidance for developing successful programs through social environments. And so for those that are not familiar with the social ecological model, at the heart of it is the individual. So the individual's knowledge, attitude, and skills, it goes out from there to think about the interpersonal network or the person's social network, from there to the organization. So we're getting bigger, thinking about the organizational components, out to the community opponents, uh, components, including the cultural values and norms of the community. And then lastly, the overarching piece is the public policy. And so it thinks about those from the individual all the way out to public policy. When we contrast that with the T0 to T4 clinical and translational model, we know that T0 to T3 research focuses on preclinical and foundational research, translation to humans, translational clinical settings, and then translation to practice. Whereas T4 research really focuses on translation to populations. And what I find interesting comparing and contrasting the two is that the individual level of the social ecological model, the focus on the person, pathophysiology, treatments, is really much of that basic and translational science. It's kind of that T0 to T3 research. Whereas the interpersonal, organizational, community, and public policy aspects of the social ecological model are really the T4 translational research that is performed. So choices, behavioral change, environment, and policy are critically important to many of the most prevalent endocrine disorders, including diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. Thus, focusing on T4 research to address these levels of the socio-ecological model is critically important, and I would say just as critically important, for prevention and treatment of many endocrine disorders as the T0 to T3 research. So we not only need to understand the hormone and the receptor and all the pathophysiology, but we have to understand the person in the context of their own community. And I think that that is what this COVID-19 pandemic has really shown a bright light on, is the gravity of that exact issue. How do we understand the person in their environment, which is really in that T4 research domain? When you think about all the research that's being done how much focus is there on the T4 domain versus the others? Is, is it kind of lopsided? Do we need more of it? Where are we at with that? Yeah, I think it's an area uh, where we definitely need more research. And we need more researchers to understand communities. But not only understand the communities and the people, be able to link it back to some of that T0 to T3 research. So one of the ways that I think about this is clinical trial diversity where the T0 to T3 research comes up with excellent therapeutics to treat disease. But we have to get it to the people and populations that need it most. And so in the clinical trials, we need diverse clinical trials that really represent the broad diversity of America so that we know that these medications work for all individuals. And then when we kind of try to get it out to those same communities, we can say, yes, we've tested this in individuals that look like yourself, And we know it works well so that we can really impact people and populations with the therapeutics that are discovered in that T0 to T3 research. So that's why I think they really need to function together. Are there any challenges or barriers to getting some of this research done? One of the challenges and barriers is a lack of research and researchers who are diverse and who focus on issues of health disparities and health equity from a basic translational and population science lens. And so I think that that's once again where the Endocrine Society FLAIR program, the Future Leaders Advancing Research in Endocrinology, is just so pivotal. The FLAIR program aims to provide graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, clinical fellows, and junior faculty from underrepresented minority communities with the necessary knowledge and skills to help them transition to a career of independence to be an independent scientist, to have successful and rewarding careers in endocrine research. I am a proud alumnus of the FLAIR program, and it was pivotal in my transition from fellowship over to faculty, 
and has been pivotal in my early years of faculty and giving me the tools to be successful in uh, really mitigating some of the disparities that we see. So I am very grateful for the program. I think it's an excellent opportunity for all those out there who are postdoc fellows, clinical fellows, graduate students, et cetera, to take advantage of. And we're going to leave it there. Be sure to tune into part two of our interview with Dr. Joseph when we discuss healthcare disparities in research and policy. We also talk about how when it comes to reducing health disparities, it's important for endocrinologists to be involved in community engagement. In today's episode, Dr. Joseph mentioned several resources, and we've linked to them in the description of this podcast. You can find that at endocrine.org slash podcast. As always, thanks for listening. Endocrine News Podcasts are a free service of the Endocrine Society. To learn more or to become a member, visit the Society's website at www.endocrine.org.